Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jean-Philippe Stein, Senior Economist with the European Investment Bank. And it's my privilege today to present to you a few of the highlights of our forthcoming report on banking sectors in Africa. This report is going to be officially launched on November 22nd, so most people have to wait until then to have the privilege to flip through it. And we will launch it in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, in partnership with UNIDO. Let me start by giving you a brief outline of the key points I want to touch upon in this presentation. First, I'd like to start with an overview of the recent history of banking sectors in Sub-Saharan Africa in terms of their depth, how fast and how deep they have evolved. And we'll see that most African banking sectors have increased their depth by about 10% over the last two decades, which is remarkable because it includes the most dramatic financial crisis since the Great Depression. Second, I would like to discuss with you the shifting market focus of banking groups in Sub-Saharan Africa. What we'll see is that banks that we survey in our report have evolved in terms of their focus away from multinationals and large local companies and towards a greater focus on SME financing. Third, uh, I'd like to report to you what banks tell us they feel is their main obstacles in deploying more credit to small and medium enterprises in Sub-Saharan Africa. Those obstacles are important for us development partners because they can inform the type of products, the types of instruments and policies that we put forward to make improvements in this space. Fourth, I'd like to more specifically uh, discuss with you the importance of lending in local currency, so as to shelter banks from currency risks. As banks in increasingly expose themselves to local SMEs with revenue streams in local currency, they will need support from IFIs, DFIs, equally in local currency, so that there isn't a mismatch between the ultimate clients of those credit lines, on the one hand, and the credit that IFIs, DFIs provide. Fifth, I'd like to take us at the demand that our, the banks that we survey report in terms of their needs for portfolio guarantees. And we will see that the glass is kind of half full. Almost half of our surveyed banks report that their needs are being met, but the other side of the coin is that more than half of the banks report that their needs are not being met. So this opens great opportunities together with local currency lending and other policy options that I will mention for IFIs, DFIs, more generally development partners, to up their games and improve the effectiveness of the tools and instruments that they deploy in Sub-Saharan Africa to improve lending to SMEs, but also access to finance. And indeed, this, is, this will be my sixth point. Uh, we'll discuss uh, the evolution of digital financial inclusion in Sub-Saharan Africa. And we will see, for instance, that while mobile money, for instance, was an epiphenomenon to be observed in Kenya just 10 years ago, and people were hoping that it would start to spill over in the sub-region, and then hopefully in some distant future to the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa, that actually now we can observe the rise of digital financial inclusion throughout the continent, to various degrees, obviously. But uh, this is a source of great hope, but we'll also discuss some of the limitations. There are no questions yet. Uh, let me turn to my first point. So let me just first start by explaining uh, this, uh, this, this slide. What we're plotting here uh, in this bar chart is credit to the private sector in Sub-Saharan Africa across the different banking sectors. So we look at all the banking sectors in the region and we split them into four buckets, first quartile, second quartile, third quartile, and so on. And then this is a trick to see just how the distribution of those banking sectors has evolved as measured by this ratio, which is taken as a rough proxy for banking sector debt. It obviously has limitations, but at least it's measurable everywhere and uh, in homogeneously, relatively homogeneously. 
it doesn't tell you where the money goes, and this is what we're going to get into afterwards. But I'd like to just use this very simple slide to derive some pretty simple observations. First of all, if you look at the median banking sector in Sub-Saharan Africa, its depth has increased quite noticeably between, over the, the last two decades. From 1997 to 2017, we've moved from the equivalent of 10% of GDP, of credit to the private sector, to more than 20%, 21% to be precise. And we can see that this, there's actually even an acceleration during the last decade, despite, again, uh, the financial crisis that the world has uh, recently suffered from. And the, the th first and, sec and third quartile that are there to show you that this is not a figment of the median, that if you look at either the least developed part of the bank distribution of banking sectors on the one hand, and the, the more developed part, you see a similar phenomenon. In fact, arguably, in relative terms, the, the deepening of banking sectors in the least developed banking sectors, i.e. in the first quartile, has been more dramatic than even elsewhere. Although, what's interesting is that it characterizes all quartile, including more developed banking sectors, which are still going strong in terms of deepening suggesting that most banking sectors in sub-Saharan Africa have a long way to go before they reach some, any kind of steady state or optimal depth. Yes? Yeah, one, one question. Uh, one, one question. Thank you for the presentation. Does it mean that globally, um, I mean, taking all the banking sector uh, for the sub-Saharan African region, that um, they, they have gained in, in, in terms of in, in depth, um, in, in depth uh, for the whole continent? Um, I mean, is it true and is it also so confirmed? I don't know if you have the latest data, but confirmed during the last two or three years where we have seen, uh, I mean, a rise in the non-performing loans uh, mm -hmm. all over the, the, the continent and also in some, for some countries, some, some recessions. So it means that it's, it's also confirmed during that, that period. Well, thank you for that challenging question. Uh, I will say yes and no. Uh, I would say... Look, if, if you look at the nitty-gritty of the distribution over time, of course you'll see some countries taking two steps forward, one step backward. So this is not to say that every single banking sector has been making that kind of pro progress. That's why we use this sort of statistics, to try and sort out the general trends characterizing those sectors. So the answer is sort of yes. I mean, most sectors have been going the right way. But of course, I could point my fingers to a few failures either temporary or more structural. My question regarding, my answer regarding your second question would be rather no, in the sense that yes, it's correct. Uh, the last couple of years have been quite challenging for most banking sectors in Sub-Saharan Africa, and we've seen some sort of either slowdown in the deepening or consolidation in some places, sharp rise in, in non-performing loans, as, as uh, you mentioned. We believe we are now at, at the turning point and that the, the, the credit cycle is starting to pick up again thanks to uh, accelerating growth in at least a large part of the continent. But yes, this has been a rough patch. So while this trend has been strong and relatively stable over the course of these two de decades, I will not hide from you that uh, this trend has been challenged a little bit during the last two decades. I would not conclude that banking depth has decreased, but it stopped accelerating as fast as we used to be. Yeah. I don't know if anyone wants to use the microphone at this stage, uh, uh, but otherwise I will uh, make, uh, I, I think we're good with this slide, we've, we've discussed it quite extensively, so I would like to move to our next slide. This slide now re relies on a survey that I've already alluded to of uh, banking groups in Africa that we run on a quasi-annual basis. So basically, we have a sample of close to 30 banks that uh, banking groups operating in sub-Saharan Africa that we ask questions to. And we ask them all kinds of questions, rela including related to their, to their strategy in sub-Saharan Africa. And this question asks them, what is the sector that represents your highest priority in terms of business development, for instance? Is it large multinationals, large local companies, retail clients, SMEs? 
The, and we, we've done that across uh, several issues, and this is the latest comparison. And but basically, trust me, we've seen the sort of trend we see here across uh, the earlier editions as well. The main conclusions to be derived is obviously just how important the focus of banking groups in Sub-Saharan Africa is on SMEs. Close to six banking groups out of 10 are focusing on SMEs. The, the, and, and, and this is still rising at the margin. The next, yes. Excuse me. Uh, I have a question on this because do, do you think that this trend or this uh, picture, that the fact that uh, SMEs are the focus market for the banks is due to the incentive from uh, EIBs or these international mm. financial institutions that do uh, grant credit line for these kind of markets? Do you think there is a relation? Well, thanks for that question. I, to be entirely honest, we can't rule it out. So obviously banks, this is a subjective survey, so banks tell us what they want to tell us. To mitigate uh, that problem, I would mention that we include in the survey not only banks that are client of ours, but also banks that are not client of ours. And while that could be true in explaining, let's say, the level of interest that bank express to SMEs, it doesn't really quite explain the trends. Because there's, it should be, or it's harder to think that one year suddenly banks have a stronger incentives to tell us they want to work with SMEs, or if they do, it's for the right reasons, not because they're talking to us. So because I've been observing these trends over a few past issues, I am not tempted necessarily to dismiss a potential bias, but to say that there's still something going on. Just exactly the magnitude is questionable. Is, it, it, is the true number closer to 40 rather than 60? Uh, that's difficult to say. But the, 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 the fact remains that we see rising interest from uh, banking groups in Sub-Saharan Africa in financing SMEs. And that's just corroborated also by anecdotal evidence, discussions we have on the ground with, with our clients and the way we see uh, their capacity developing. This, I hope this answers your question. Yes, it does. Yes. So the next thing I'd like to uh, point your attention to is the sharp rise in the focus on retail clients. And that, for instance, doesn't concern us because EIB doesn't particularly incentivize its clients to, to work with real client, uh, retail clients. And the reason behind this is because uh, banks have been increasingly relying on deposit financing. This is partly to be related to their focus on SMEs. If, if they're trying to expand the exposure to SMEs, that's an exposure in local currency most of the time. And therefore, they need a matching uh, liabilities in local currency. So there are other factors, but this reflects, amongst other factors, the fact that banks are trying to expand the local currency proportion of their balance sheets, both on the asset and liability side. Something has to decrease in, in reverse, and that's uh, their, the, the, the strategic priority they put on large local companies and large multinationals. It doesn't mean they've lost interest in them. It, it means that at the margin, this is not where they're looking for expansion. Because the story is not that large multinationals are not uh, you know, privileged clients that all banks would love to have in their portfolio. It, the story is that there's rising competition, and if they want to maintain their growth rates and the profit, profit margins, they now need to get out of their comfort zone. And their next, their next challenge is to go out, not maybe after all SMEs, but we'll return to that, but at least some of the most solid, those that, have, that are reasonably uh, stable financially, have, a, have, have, have healthy streams of revenue, and that they can make good returns on without taking too much risk at the margin. So I'm going to now tell you about another, the answers to another question, which is basically we ask our banks, if you, if you were considering expanding credit to SMEs, what do you consider in that process to be the biggest obstacle? And we offered them many more options than this, and they had the option of uh, you know, volunteering uh, a, 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 uh, an obstacle of their own. 
But the findings are that the number one obstacles that uh, banking groups identify is the lack of reliable collateral. And if you've been uh, traveling to those countries, that will not come as a surprise. It's a constant story. The next uh, most cited uh, obstacle is the high default rate. And if you take collateral and default rate together, you've got about two-thirds of the bank's answers. So the two-thirds of the bank's answers center on collateral and default rates with the implication that there's probably great potential for portfolio guarantees. If this is where their main concern is, then if you could alleviate that concern, then clearly uh, you may have significant impact on the willingness to go forward with a loan that otherwise they would consider as too risky. What we think is another interesting result from this survey is that there is still another remaining 17% of the answers that uh, concerns managerial capacity. I will return to this. We think it's a very important result. It, it points to the soft side, the demand side of, loan, of the loan market, and how important it is to make sure that not just banks are capacitated to provide loan to SMEs, but SMEs are, have the managerial and financial capacity to actually put forward a credible uh, credit proposal or loan proposal, loan request. There are other factors that, that matters, like lack of information, costly monitoring, uh, absence of uh, good credit bureaus. These are all important things. Many uh, development partners actually subsidize uh, capacity building efforts and, and technical assistance concerning these, these obstacles, including EIB, we, we, we're, we, uh, we, we're making a financial contribution to technical assistance centers known as AFRITAX. They are technical assistance centers run by the IMF that provide uh, support to governments in trying, for instance, to create credit reference bureaus, etc. But So that gives you the, the big picture. I don't think it was necessarily predicated. The point is, we didn't quite know what would come on top. And I don't think there were many studies before that tried to tease out the relative importance of those factors. Everybody knows that all these matter, but really how much and what's most important was, was what we were trying to find out. Hello. Um, I'm a little bit surprised by, by the results because uh, I uh, thought that the lack of financing of SME is... Um, more linked to the lack of uh, formal accounts mm -hmm. or um, maybe the cost of uh, monitoring. So uh, um, how do you explain that uh, almost two-thirds of the SMEs take uh, um, mention collateral and default rate? Well, again, I, I <laughs> this is... We, were, we did not have uh, set expectation when we threw that question to, uh, to, to banking groups. The thing is that, seen from a bank's perspective, you're not necessarily looking at the whole distribution of SMEs that you could potentially, uh, at the maximum, reach out to and lend to. You're probably looking at the next best SME that you could extend a credit line to, in which case, the most, your most pressing concern is, can I get some, some kind of credible collateral from this SME so that if that revenue stream they're asking me to bank on does not actually materialize, I can still re recuperate at least some of my, some of my money. And then, so this probably in some ways suggests that banks are not necessarily looking yet or making a priority yet about the most fragile or least or most uh, or least uh, capacitated SMEs. They're still looking at fairly solid SMEs where managerial capacity only worries them uh, to the tune of one banks in five. I would think that if, if they do their job well in the next five to ten years and there are more and more SMEs are being lent to, then managerial capacity will become their topmost concern because the next SME they will want to lend to, well, not then be an SME they don't, they don't, they don't they, they worry about collateral for, they will, but their main concern will be that this, the, 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 the CEO of that SME doesn't actually have a solid business plan. 
So that's my best interpretation of those numbers, but I, I do agree that um, that is, it's, this is a good question you were, we're asking, you're asking. Again, it's, I think this is the first time such questions have been asked to, uh, to my knowledge, to banking groups, so you're suggesting an excellent follow-up question in the next edition of our survey. Nice time for our next slide. Um, this is yet another question from our survey, where basically we've asked our banks how they see demand for loans in different currencies, be it local currency, USD, Euro, or other hard currencies. And we've asked them whether they felt that demand for loans in that particular currency was either stronger or in line or below market trends. The, the most striking results from this question or observation one can make based on this question is that three banks, banking groups out of 10, consider the, the demand for loans in local currency as stronger than market trends, while the rest of the banks, seven out of 10, consider it in line with market trends. So this definitely points for a strong market segment along which IFIs and DFIs and development partners could provide support to banks who are trying to expand their balance sheets in the, in, in the direction of making local currency loans. If you look at the rest of the graph, it, you, you'll see that it's not like demand for loans in hard currency is a, is a, is a thing of the past. There's still demand for that. It's, it's, it comes out as weaker, and it shows that there's probably still a role that IFIs, DFIs can play in, in this space, although it's probably not the next frontier. And it's perhaps no surprise. You start, even amongst SMEs, you have SMEs that are import and export goods. Therefore, even SMEs that have uh, their revenue streams in, in hard currency, let alone multinationals. But that it does not seem to be the most dynamic part of the market. Based on, based on our results, at least. Let me now move on to, uh, to yet another question, the last that I will illustrate today, uh, that we put to banking groups in, in, our, in, our, um, in our survey. We basically asked them, if you consider the, your needs for portfolio guarantees, do you consider them as met, partially met, largely unmet, or possibly irrelevant? As you can see, 45%, less than 50% of banking group consider their needs for portfolio guarantees as met. So you can, you can see the glasses half full in the sense that uh, IFI DFIs have done some work in this space. It's not like there is no such thing as a portfolio guarantee product. But the flip side of this result is that you've got 50% of banking sector groups that report that they're needs are either partially met or largely unmet. And um, as, as is perhaps to be expected, it's not something that's particularly new uh, as a message, but here we're able to quantify it and basically get confirmation from, from banks with a, with, a, with a local footprint. This, uh, there's a, this potentially a large untapped market for portfolio products. Now, let's not be naive. If, if that's the case, there are probably still good reasons for it. And the reason may have to do with pricing, for instance. Banks locally may have seen some products and decided not to take them on because they consider them as too pricey. Uh, banks and IFIs, DFIs trying to roll out those products may face challenges in estimating just how much to charge for such complicated uh, products that are not, do not lend themselves easily to the standard type of credit analysis that a simple plain vanilla bank loans uh, would require. So nobody's arguing here that there's a quick fix, but it's hard not to think that there isn't uh, a large unmet demand there and something to be done, especially if you recall that the main obstacles that banks report to be to lending further to SMEs is lack of collateral, and uh, in the high default rates. So this, this, is, this is at least congruent. Um, it's not just uh, the banking groups are at least being consistent the way they answer our survey. This is enough for banks per se. I, I'd like us to 
take a look a little bit at individuals now. And to do, to do this, I'm going to rely on uh, the World Bank's latest Findex survey. And I would like us to take a look at uh, the comparison between figures between 2011 and 2017 in terms of account ownership. That encompasses all kinds of accounts, both brick and mortar and mobile money accounts. Bank accounts, the, these are your traditional bank accounts. Savings products, largely defined, and loan products, largely defined. And some, there are some really salient uh, and striking observations to be made indeed. In the course of just a few years, this isn't two decades, this is six years, you've seen a 20% jump in the number of accounts largely defined in sub-Saharan Africa, and correspondingly, a 10% increase in traditional bank accounts. By deduction, you know that the other 10% is made out of primarily mobile banking account. So it's 10% it's mobile, 10% brick and mortar, even if you split, but still, off of a base of 23%, that's a huge jump. So I, I think we can call that a success. Unfortunately, we'll see that there's several qualifiers to that. The first one is that it hasn't translated very much into a, a similar surge in terms of the use of savings and loans products i.e. we suspect that many of those accounts are kind of uh, passive. They're, we, they're not being used, uh, at least for the type of users that we would wish. Maybe there's a lot of money being transferred, and that's, that's not a bad thing. But when it comes to savings, uh, to using those accounts to save for rainy days, uh, let's say you have uh, a woman who has a family and is stashing a little bit of money aside, for uh, in case uh, anybody has a health issue within the, in the family or for future, future education purposes and things like that, we'd like to see a greater impact in terms of the number of, we'd like to see the rising number of accounts be reflected in more savings. Similarly, uh, there's not been that much uh, impact in terms of the number, the proportion of the population that has actually been able to access a loan, regardless of this uh, sharp rise in the number of accounts. So it's, it's, uh, it's a bittersweet, a bittersweet uh, take, take, take away. On their, their, obviously, digital financial inclusion and even just even traditional financial inclusion are improving on the continent. But it hasn't, the, the, the rubber doesn't really seem to be, have been hitting the ground in terms of traction with respect to important products such as savings and, and loans. Now, let me get, give you some further qualifiers now. If you compare Sub-Saharan Africa to the set of all developing countries, the, uh, the amount of progress that the region can still make becomes even more visible. You can see that there's, a, as far as, for instance, account ownership is concerned, there's a 20% gap as of today still between Sub-Saharan Africa and developing countries, which is not a unduly demanding benchmark. We're not talking about emerging countries here. We're talking about developing countries. So countries in the same income categories as, more or less, as the sub-Saharan African economies we're talking about. So there's still a long way to go. What's interesting, though, is two more nuanced findings. If you look at the difference between bank account ownership, on the one hand, and account ownership, on the other end, within developing countries, the difference is only 2%. So that, it doesn't, it's, it's only, only has a marginal impact. If you look at it <clears throat> in sub-Saharan Africa, you have that 10% difference I was referring to in the previous slide. So it's, <clears throat> if any progress has been made in, in sub-Saharan Africa, it's both of brick and mortar, because of brick and mortar or traditional bank accounts, and uh, mobile banking accounts, but what's special in Sub-Saharan Africa is just how much of that catch-up has to be uh, attributed to uh, digital financial inclusion, which doesn't play a similarly important role in developing countries in general. The other two interesting findings that I think this slide shows is, first of all, with respect to savings product, there is a noticeable difference. Okay, it's not of the same magnitude than account ownership, but somehow in developing in countries in general, 
we've somehow managed to get more people to use savings products. There are probably some lessons to be learned there, some good practices uh, to, be, uh, to be imported uh, to, to Sub-Saharan Africa. With respect to loans, the difference is positive, but not very significant. And I think this points to the fact that um, extending loans to poor population remains a challenge globally for various reasons. Reach. Some of these populations are rural and difficult to reach, whether this is rural Africa or rural Latin America or rural Southeast Asia. You have uh, discriminated populations, unfortunately, all over the world, and that bites there. And uh, therefore, there's, it's equally true that sometimes it's important to adapt existing instruments from one region to another, making sure that they are useful in context, than to say that there, we st there are still some global challenges that we need to think carefully about, such as how do we increase access to finance for poor people? There are, of course, a number of strategies that have been, uh, that have been contemplated and are being experimented with. My point is that this is work in progress, to say the least. Um, up. Okay, so that's slowly brings me to, uh, to an end. But before we get there, I'd like to wrap up some of uh, the findings we've been disc discussing uh, in terms of both opportunities and challenges. As we begin by arguing, we observe, and this is, this is, these are not the only indicators we have, obviously I've made a selection here for the sake of time, rising competition in, bank, in African banking markets. And partly for that reason, banks are now incentivized to get out of their comfort zone. They're getting more serious about lending to SMEs. A few years ago, when I used to go to the region, they were talking about setting up a unit for SME lending. And they were very proud about having that project. I've seen SME lending unit, including in Central Africa. So the trains left the station. Nobody's arguing that it's arrived as its destination. But there's something going on that has to do most likely with rising competition from Pan-African banking groups, from uh, regional banking groups that are, uh, uh, that are fighting harder together for deposit funding and for clients. We've also seen that there are quite salient potential opportunities for IFIs, DFIs like EIB in terms of local currency lending and guarantees. Banking groups are quite clear uh, with respect to express, expressing unmet needs in this space. <clears throat> Therefore, more work should probably be spent on designing the right instruments and structures to allow for more local currency lending and more portfolio guarantees. One reason being that the more you're asking those banks to expose themselves to the SME sector, the more the riskier you make those banks, because they, they, they started off lending to the most secure lenders in town, multinationals and large national companies, and now you're asking to go down the food chain to more and more riskier and possibly in, more interesting in terms of social impact, but more and more riskier clients. The end game cannot be one where we make all these banking groups very risky and where we threaten financial stability in some of those markets. So the risk is somehow to be pooled and shared between development partners. And local currency lending is one way to get currency risk off these banks' balance sheet. And on the other hand, guarantee, portfolio guarantees is one way to take credit risk. So the devil is in the detail how appropriate, effective those instruments are so that um, they strike the right balance. One extreme, you have pure market instruments that just reflect the pricing of the underlying risk. At the other, you have concessional instruments that include a layer of first loss guarantee or second loss guarantee. There are different options you can play with. And the question then becomes, uh, in context, what's the right instrument? Because the goal is not necessarily to incentivize maximum lending to SMEs. You want to, to incentivize it up to the point where you've reached out to all those SMEs that are viable. Uh, over indebtedness is not necessarily uh, the, the goal of the game here, and I'll return to this in a moment. So financial inclusion is rising, but we've seen that with at least two major caveats. One 
in Sub-Saharan Africa, he hasn't translated much into significant forays in terms of le lending and saving. <clears throat> so there's a lot of accounts being opened. <coughs> Pardon me. A lot of that has probably has to do with transfers, which is a useful service, but probably not uh, the ultimate goal that we're trying to reach here in terms of improving the quality of the livelihood of the people at stake. Yes. Well, maybe just two questions, especially on your last point, and let me play a bit of devil's advocate. Why do you think that financial inclusion still has a long way to go in sub-Saharan Africa? And additionally, sort of, why do you think it would be a good thing uh, for the depth of banking sectors in Africa to increase? Um, that's a good question. I think the naive way to answer your question is to say, look, look at the gap, both in terms of where Sub-Saharan Africa lies versus other developing countries. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of comparing apples with apples, like countries at similar stages of development. And I'm looking at Africa. I'm looking at how fast it has come from behind and how creative uh, local bank, banking players, banking sector players have been in reaching out to the, the underserved part of the population. And I'm just projecting them, say, this, with, given how creative they are, they're going to reach at least the levels of inclusion we see uh, elsewhere in developing countries. To be entirely honest, I think it's more complicated than that because that all is, this is all predicated on, on basically the health of the corresponding economies. If, if Africa was going to hit a rough patch within the next few years, let's say, because the price of uh, commo primary commodities takes a, a big dive or things like that. Uh, so this isn't a hard science. This is more like uh, transporting. You're, you're trying to see you know, some sort of potential. And to be even more qualified, I'd say, let me go back to my early point, which is, it's not always good. It, you have to be a little careful here. Uh, they, within the world of microfinance, for instance, there's the, the best and the worst, and we all know that. So it's, it's, in most cases, it's been quite good uh, in terms of expanding access to microentrepreneurs to credit. But you can't rule out excesses and, and malpractices entirely either, where consumption has been, uh, has been, uh, has been financed with people getting over-indebted. So I think it's... The problem with these micro figures is it doesn't tell you the fine grain and the how. So uh, just allow me a second of humility. I, I see a potential. Whether that potential is met and whether it's for better or for good will be depends on the micro specific in each context of the quality of the regulation, how well consumers are protected. And I was going to that, to that in a second. How, how good regulation is how well supervised those financial actors are, and so on. And all this fine grain had to be glossed over here. So I, I can only agree with you. I still think there's a lot of potential, but uh, the devil is in the detail in terms of whether or not you actually make a positive impact on people's life. Challenges. Now, this is, this were, these were still opportunities. Now, the real challenges are coming. Um, with, with every change comes challenges. And one of them here is that as you're reaching out to first-time depositors, we've seen that there's, there's a growing focus of banking groups on, uh, deposit, of, on, on deposit collection, which is great. So you have a, great, a rising proportion of population and trusting the banks with their money as opposed to more informal uh, financial mechanisms or even just their mattress with all the problems that this can, this can generate in terms of uh, financial security. But this also raises the question of how secure those deposits are. It wouldn't take much of a bank run to scare off for another generation those first-time depositors. Hence the importance in terms of making this deepening of sub-Saharan African banking sector sustainable of making sure that it's done in a sustainable way, not just in a cowboy way, and, but in a way that makes sure that those people will be able to withdraw their money when they want to, and that uh, this doesn't end in, uh, in tears. And similarly, you also have a, a, a widening range of people act with, a, with access to credit. We also need to make sure that those borrowers are protected. 
So consumer protection concerns not only just depositors, but also borrowers. As you expand the reach of those financial products, there's always the potential for market abuse by agents. So we always imagine agents as being well-intended people, and we, just, we hope that most of them are. But you can't rule out ex ante that some of them be actually in the business of forcing on loans to people who can't afford them or selling loans for the wrong purpose and so on and so forth. So this is just a, an important general point and an important general call for improving consumer protection law in the financial sectors, especially as now we're reaching to more and more vulnerable types of consumers. Similarly, this was pointed out, we've seen recently a sharp rising non-performing loans. We don't think it's directly related to this effort to reach out to SMEs. It's more for uh, business cycle, related to business cycle reasons. The econo most economies in Sub-Saharan Africa have gone through a rough patch in the last couple of years. But nonetheless, this is a bit concerning, and it, and, and it, and it, it raises questions about the sustainability of uh, banking sector deepening in the region. It needs to be addressed. The right way to address this is to strengthen regulation, strengthen the capacity of supervisors, and on the other side, the side of the banks, uh, help banks uh, become better at monitoring and controlling risks. And this is, these are all entry points for IFIs, DFIs, and development partners, depending on their comparative advantage, to come and support the, the, the financial development in banking sector in Sub-Saharan Africa. I would like to finally return to, uh, to a sort of uh, a more subtle point we made earlier on, which is that 17% of banks that report that their first obstacle, I, think, I find this striking, is the lack of managerial capacity among SMEs. There's a saying uh, that, that goes, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Well, we have credit lines. We sometimes have portfolio guarantee products. So every, the, whole, the whole problem of private sector development and SME uh, and, and of uh, helping uh, the development of SMEs in Africa sounds like a financial problem to us. And it is to a large extent, I'm convinced of that. But the mirror, the sort of the real or main street flip side of that is that you need to have bankable SMEs. You, you can't, you know, as long as you don't have SMEs that can articulate a, a reasonably credible business plan and provide semi-trustworthy financial statement, it's going to be quite an act to provide them with financing. You're probably going to tell me, well, that's what fintechs is all about, and that's right. There are some really smart ways to go around some of those limitations, but at the end of the day, a good business is a good business, and training people to become better managers, better CEOs, bit better business owners is another low-hanging fruit. So there's, there's space to work from, to approach the problem for both ends. It improve the ability of banks to assess credit of smaller SMEs, but you can also improve the pipeline of SMEs. And this work will require uh, col the collaboration of many actors, because you'll need the involvement of national authorities. You may need concessionality from uh, development partners, and you may need specialized expertise from uh, diff different NGOs and, and, and non-state actors. One question regarding the, the non-performing loans. Uh, it seems that you, you, you consider that uh, the banks, it's the role of banks to, to, um, to improve the, the control of mm. the non-performing loans. But isn't it just related to, to the credit cycle or to the, the, the health of the economy of a specific country? So why, why is it just the, the role of banks? Mm. And, and, and how should they do? Maybe uh, you have additional suggestions on that. Well. Uh, I think that's good criticism, and it relates to this, uh, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. At the end of the day, uh, financial instruments, financial deepening, is just one slice of the challenges and opportunities that need to be addressed in Sub-Saharan Africa as in other developing countries. So you, you will contribute to the healthy development of the private sector by taking the right roads, to improving lending to SMEs and access to finance more generally. It also requires that those, similarly as we've argued, that we need 
uh, bankable SMEs for bank lending to happen. We need well-managed economies for the banking sector to rest on. Uh, Wall Street is a reflection of Main Street, as uh, they say in the USA. But that's true all over the world. You, the, the, your financial sector can only be as healthy as your economy is. Therefore, uh, arguing that it's important to make sure the private sector has access to the right types of resources, tools, instruments, uh, capacity building uh, uh, initiatives, you name it, is not a substitute to saying that we shouldn't help uh, governments develop uh, their, their, their capacity and improve their ability to manage their economies from a macroeconomic basis, and so on and so forth. So uh, I guess uh, I can only agree with you. It's, this is where we tend to see the problem from the angle at which we're coming from. But uh, this also reminds us that at the end of the day, promotion of the private sector is a holistic problem that needs to be addressed from many different angles, not just uh, the final, financial or purely SME angle. SMEs rely on actually on medium and large enterprises. It would be a mistake to, uh, to let them down or somehow try and uh, uh, squeeze them out of financial markets, for instance. Okay. Sure, sure. Looking at, again, at those challenges and opportunities, uh, what do you think uh, IFIs and DFIs such as DAB could or should do to uh, further contribute to financial inclusion uh, and SME lending? I guess you already mentioned some of them, but looking uh, sure. at what, what do you think can be and should be done? Okay, well, that's a, that's a good question indeed. Uh, so let me remind those that we've already pointed out. So local currency lending, because this is our work in progress. If there are just already bucks that we could take, I wouldn't uh, repeat them, but I still think that local currency lending, uh, not that it doesn't exist, but just in terms of the proportion of what is being offered in, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, should become mainstream, uh, a mainstream product and take a rising share of... Uh, of, of what the amount of money that's lending in, in the region. Uh, so, and you can generalize portfolio guarantees in terms of all kinds of de-risking. There are multiple ways in which you can leverage concessional money to take the risk off, or it's some of the risk off. Not all the risk necessarily needs to be taken off, but at least some of the risk off to make local actors, international investors more comfortable betting on a good outcome for their investment project and not exclusively in the banking sector. I would say that we tend to see the problem in a little bit of a narrow way. And uh, SME lending, how Im however important it is, is only one slice of just even the financial sector development agenda. We forget along the way the importance of insurance, micro insurance included. And it's not all about lending. People, savings products are also very important. I perhaps would argue some even more important than borrowing products. So they've, been ten they've tended to be neglected and maybe we should spend more attention to that. Because for, for a small farmer, and I'm looking at Hannah, uh, in, a, in a distant rural area, the ability to save a little bit of money, to buy some fertilizers, to buy some input, for her future crop is equally as important possibly as being able to borrow to get those inputs. And unfortunately, the poor are often at a terrible disadvantage when it comes to saving. Uh, they tend to save in their own homes or in informal financial, uh, financial using f informal financial uh, mechanisms that sometimes work and don't, sometimes don't work so well. And um, for instance, um, women sitting in their own homes can be raided by uh, their husbands, and that makes them more vulnerable. So for, there are a number of good reasons why, uh, if they're properly regulated and supervised, formal financial products are superior. And finally, uh, I think that uh, we should probably also put greater emphasis on capital market development, because this is where it all comes together. You can't have good savings products if you don't have somehow assets that have been somehow uh, structured in a way that local savers can invest on them. And vice versa, it's difficult for banks to take exposures 
to uh, to assets such as SME loans if they can't turn them off at some at some point, one way or another, on the capital markets. And most, with notable exceptions like uh, Kenya, uh, Nigeria, and South Africa, most sub-Saharan African capital markets are have a long way to go. To put it in a positive light, they have a long way to go. It's there. You can see that there's some progress being made in some places, but there's still a lack of secondary uh, capital markets and uh, and products that are still relatively uh, rudimentary. So I think that we should see SME lending, and from the broader perspective, let alone of development in general, but that's that's kind of a given of capital market development, making sure that banks have access to the type of financing they need without necessarily relying on IFIs, DFIs. The long-term name of the game should be for IFIs, DFIs to make themselves redundant. Not necessarily, not necessary for as, ever, as, as, uh, as far as the eye can see. And the, and the key to that is to help African banking sectors uh, develop the financial sector part, the insurance uh, and other subsectors part of their, of their financial sectors. So, hope I've answered your question. All right. Uh, I think I've, I've come to the end of my talk. Um, I, I would like to f finish off on inviting you again to follow us on social media in the real world if you can make it to Addis Ababa on the November 22nd on the occasion of our annual Africa Day. This year, in, uh, in partnership with UNIDO, we pick a different partner every year so that we share thoughts and, and perspective. The report will be available in two languages. We're quite proud about that, given the split of uh, languages in, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, so in English and French. So we hope that uh, this will disseminate good practices both ways. And uh, we'll, we'll start to make a lot of noise on social media and in the run-up to November 22nd, so be sure to follow our hashtags. Thank you. <laughs>